Okay, so uh, how would you translate Allah is Munazzah? So when we speak of God in the Aqidah, especially the negative attributes, um, we are doing this by way of Tanzih. Tanzih. Tanzih, as you know in Arabic, is the declaration of God as being perfect and having no fault. Uh, how do we translate this word in English? Uh, it's a very good question. Some of our great scholars have used the word transcendent. And some of our good translations, you'll see that God is transcendent. I don't like that word myself. And, how, and so we can say that he has no fault, he lacks fault. We need to find a better translation. And this is one of the things that those of us who are English speakers, uh, it's very important for us you know, to get together in a symposium and to work on good translations. We have, mashallah, right now in the English language, beautiful translations of many texts. And people like Mukhtar Holland, who died last year, Allah have mercy upon him, was a great man in my belief. And he was a good translator. He is a translator's translator. Nuh Keller is a great translator. A Sidi Abdul Hakim Winter is a great track. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. So I think that really for us in this English speaking community, it's important for us to study this now. That what are the words we want to use and why? The word transcendence, um, I don't like. And this is again because God is not in the world and God is not outside the world. God is not indwelling and he is not outdwelling. He is not in me, he is not outside of me. He is not in time and space. And historically, the concept of transcendence was one of the most destructive of all religious beliefs. Transcendence means literally to go beyond. Transcend. Send is to go. Trans to go beyond. So transcendence as a Greek philosophical concept and as a pagan philosophical concept in, uh, in Egypt, in, the, in late antiquity, in Platonism, you know, in many philosophies, was a belief that God is outside the world. God transcends the world. God is above the seventh heaven. And if we study the history of Christianity, this is one of the most important things because the, we talk about cognitive frames. Um, Christianity was a religion that was given to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, they believed in a way very similar to the way that you and I believe. And salvation for them, and Najah, was ethical salvation. That you believe in God and you do good. And inshallah, God will forgive you. And God will take you to the garden. When Christian belief goes beyond the children of Israel, it comes into the world of late antiquity, late Rome. And that is a world in which the beliefs of the Greek-speaking people, uh, the Coptic-speaking people, uh, Syrian, Syriac speakers, many people, it was radically dualistic. And Aristotelian and Platonic thought also has this dualism in it. So in this dualism, <clears throat> it was believed that the world is a defective place. And often is believed that matter, which is the basic thing in this world, is impure and it is cursed. And it is dank and dark and it brings death. And you have then in this world the human soul. And the human soul is divine. It is a spark of divinity. And it is, in, it is imprisoned in my body. So in order to be saved, uh, I have to have a savior. A sota, as they said in Greek. Sota. I have to have a savior. 
And this Savior, you have it in the cult of Isis, you have it in Mithraism, you have it in Neoplatonism, you have it in Stoicism, you have it in many different religious beliefs. But this, this Savior has to be divine and he has to be able to come down into the world and to take my soul and to take it up to God who transcends. This was a standard belief. And therefore here in Egypt, you know, when Arius of Alexandria, Arius of Alexandria was one of the great people in the church in my opinion. <clears throat> Arius of Alexandria was a mufessor. He was not a philosopher. Many people say of him, he was a philosopher. And he couldn't accept that God was, you know, Jesus Christ. Or, no, that's not true. Arius of Alexandria was a mufessor of the Bible. And he was a conservative Christian. Because in Egypt, like all parts of the early Christian world, you had people who were heirs of the Church of Jerusalem. The Church of Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him in Jerusalem. Arius is one of those. Arius dressed in white. You know, he usually uh, showed his arm. He was barefoot. Um, he dressed like the disciples of Christ himself. He was very conservative. And his opposition to those who wanted to deify Jesus Christ was a conservative Christian opposition. When Arius says that Jesus cannot be God, that he must be created. And it's very interesting because Arius in the debates, you know, the main person who debated in Egypt, do you know what his name was? He's also an Egyptian. His name was Athanasius. Athanasius. Athanasius was, you know, these are Greek speakers. They're Egyptians. Maybe they could speak Coptic, but usually they're Greek speaking Egyptians because Greek was the dominant intellectual language of Egypt at that time. Athanasius when he speaks, when he debates with Arius, he says that if Jesus Christ were not completely God, he could not be a savior. Okay? So like, if I read that, when I read that, it's like, what? If Jesus were not totally God, he could not be a savior. What's going on? See, this is cognitive frames. Because for Athanasius, and for Gregory, and for Basil, for these church fathers, Origen as well, Origen's also an Egyptian, for them, in their Greek logic, their Greek dualism, God is outside the world, he's not in the world, and the world which is matter is not good, it is the source of evil, this is why the monasteries here in Egypt often were based on imatit and myths. You know, you have monks, you can see it, you've probably seen it yourself in monasteries here. I've seen it, where the monks would tie their hair in knots against the wall so they could never sleep. They could never sleep. You know, he'll drop his head like that, but his, his hair is tied to the wall. And it, he wants to get out of his body. He wants to get out of his senses. He wants to liberate his nefs. Very interesting concepts, you know. But he must have a savior who is also divine, who can then take his ruh up to the transcendent God. This is the cognitive frame, you see? And this is what Arius of Alexandria was against, because he said, this is not the biblical teaching. This is not the biblical teaching. And it's very interesting because, you know, in Surat Ali Imran, when Allah says, he said, it is he, God, who revealed the book. You know, um, you know, of it there are muhkamat, there are verses that are absolutely clear. لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا هو ليس كمثله شيء ولم يكن له كفر أحد محكمات هن أم الكتاب They are the foundation of the book. They are the meaning of the book that all other interpretations must go back to. And there are other verses that are similar. They speak of God in a way that is similar to creation. Okay? Um, and so the, the verse makes it very clear, you know, that 
يعني that we base our religion on the muhkamat. When were these verses revealed? They were revealed according to some of our scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, in his book, Al-Jawab al-Sahih, which is a very good book. It's probably the best book Ibn Taymiyyah ever wrote, in my opinion. Al-Jawab al-Sahih is a very good book. In that, he says, and other mufassirs hold that position, they have other opinions as well. They say that this was revealed when Weftu Najran came to visit the Prophet in Medina. Weftu Najran was the biggest delegation that ever came to the Prophet And, you know, they came early in the Medinan period. I don't know if you remember, maybe the third year? I don't know, I don't remember. Was it the third year? I don't remember. It's in the early period. And it was a big delegation of Christians from the Najran. And there were Trinitarian Christians, and there were others as well. That's what they say. They, they had different points of view. But, you know, the leaders of that delegation, when they come to the Prophet, they try to use the mutashabihat of the Qur'an to justify the Trinity. That God speaks of himself, for example, as inna and nahnu, and so forth. And that's when this was revealed. In fact, you know, maybe the first 70 verses, a number of verses of Ali Ibn they were... And this is amazing because this was also Arius' position. Arius, he said, that in interpreting the Bible, we must follow the muhkamat. That the Bible, which is a beautiful text, you know, I mean, it has historical problems, it has linguistic problems, and it has to be studied very carefully and with great respect. But the Bible is very clear that God is one that God is not like anything in the heavens and the earth or the sea. And you can make no image to him, and so forth. So he said that whenever we understand about the Gospels, about the greatness of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, it cannot contradict that. He can, whatever you say, you cannot make him a God. So this was his position. And what he said, Athanasius and others do it, we're doing is you are taking verses that are mutashabihat, such as references to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, usually in the Bible, Jesus is referred to as Baur Isha. Baur Isha, which means what? Baur is Ibn. Isha is what? Al Ins. Al Insan. Ibn al Insan. So he is Baur Isha. He is the Son of Man. That's usually the way that he's referred to. But he says that, you know, you cannot take these verses. Which are also, you have verses like that in the Bible about Adam, you have verses like that about Jacob, you have verses like that about other great prophets. You cannot understand them in a way that contradicts the muhkamat. So this is really, really interesting. But in any case, transcendence is a very uh, problematic word in the history of religion. And that's the reason why I don't like to use it. But again, we need a good word for tanzi. We need a very good word for that. Bi'ithni ta'ala.